Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the RAPS Indiana Chapters webcast, Global Medical Device and IVD Regulatory Changes in 2020 and their impact on Asia Pacific. Before we get started, I'd like to say thank you to our chapter sponsors. Thank you to Brandwood, Fang Consulting, Network Partners, ReadTech, and R&Q. They help make these events possible. I'd also like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. In the RAPS Learning Portal, attendees will need to enter a completion code to receive credit for today's event. We will show the code on this screen at the conclusion of the webinar, as well as in the chat in the GoTo interface. The code will also be distributed after the program ends in a follow-up email that will come from the GoTo platform within 48 hours from this event. To claim credit, access the webcast in your account in the RAPS Learning Portal and click Enter Your Code to Receive Credit just above the description. A pop-up box will appear where you can enter the code provided. We've also taken a screenshot and an example of an attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this in your computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. You're listening and using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone and the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit, to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may submit your questions at any time during the presentation, and we'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Carolyn Smith, a chapter leader from the RAPS Indiana chapter. Over to you, Carolyn. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the RAPS Indiana chapter webcast, Global Medical Device and IVD Regulatory Changes in 2020 and Their Impact to Asia Pacific. My name is Carolyn Schmidt, and I'm one of the RAPS Indiana chapter leads, and I'd like to introduce you to, to today's speakers. Our first speaker is John Lockwood from Pearl Pathways, where he serves as director of QA and RA services. John has over 25 years of experience in quality, regulatory, validation, auditing, and purchasing roles in the life sciences industry. In addition to holding a variety of positions within small and large medical device manufacturers, John also brings over a decade of experience in consulting and operations. John is an accredited lead auditor, has regulatory affairs certification from RAPS, and has earned multiple certifications from the American Society for Quality. Our second speaker today is TJ Thiel. TJ has worked in quality and regulatory affairs in the Australian, US, and European medical device and diagnostics industries for more than 20 years. From major multinationals to small startups, TJ has deep experience with global regulatory approvals and registration, providing clients with planning and strategy suitable for both local and worldwide product launches. TJ has delivered regulatory approvals, including FDA 510K, PMA and de novo, CE Marking, Health Canada, TGA, PMDA, and NMPA. He has provided due diligence activities for company acquisitions regarding the target's business viability, quality system status, and regulatory position. TJ holds regulatory affairs certification from RAPS. And with that, I'd like to hand the presentation over to John. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, my presentation is gonna be focused on recent changes to medical device requirements in the US and Europe. Uh, and then uh, TJ will follow up with uh, further discussion about Asia PAC and, and how those changes have affected uh, that region of the world. Um, there we go. Uh, so uh, as Carolyn mentioned that I work for Pearl Pathways uh, as the director of QARA services. Uh, Pearl is a full service consulting firm uh, that works in the uh, biologics, pharmaceutical and medical device uh, industries. Uh, we cover both clinical uh, quality as well as regulatory. We've been in business for about 10 years uh, and we're located in downtown Indianapolis. So from an agenda perspective, uh, I'm gonna talk about MDR and IVDR related changes first, uh, and then transition into recent FDA changes. Uh, and then last uh, will be uh, some discussion on FDA COVID-19 uh, response from FDA. So there've been a number of significant guidances that have been published uh, since the beginning of the pandemic in March, 2020. Uh, specifically, uh, most of these guidances relate to uh, the MDR. Um, a couple of them that are noteworthy 
uh, is uh, the MDCG 2018-1, uh, which is the basic UDI, DI, uh, and changes to UDI, uh, DI uh, guidance. Uh, basically, the, the, the gist of this guidance is to relate to the fact that if, uh, if you make uh, particular changes to your device, uh, that it will require a new UDI number uh, to be assigned uh, so that it will prevent uh, misidentification of the device uh, and ambiguity uh, in its traceability. Uh, some of those changes are, that uh, can affect this are the name or trade name of the device, uh, the device version or model number might change, uh, if it's labeled as single use or packaged as sterile, uh, the need for sterilization before use, uh, change in the quantity of devices provided in the package, uh, changes to critical warnings or counterindications, uh, and then if there are any endocrine disruptors uh, in the product. In addition, there was a guidance uh, published uh, also in March uh, on significant changes regarding the transition period, uh, uh, for Article 120 of the MDR. Uh, this uh, guidance is MDCG 2020-3. Uh, and it provides clarification on when changes to a device should be considered significant as it relates to Article 120, uh, subsection 3 of the MDR. Uh, if a manufacturer wishes to make uh, a significant change to design or intended purpose under the MDR, uh, you're not allowed to basically put it on the market until that, until that change has been appropriately assessed uh, as per the MDR requirements. Uh, also published in 2020, uh, in March, uh, was a guidance on clinical evaluation uh, and performance evaluation requirements uh, for medical device software. Uh, this was under MDCG 2020-1. Uh, this guidance provides a framework for the determination of the appropriate level of clinical evidence that's needed for uh, medical device software uh, in order to demonstrate compliance to the uh, requirements in the MDR and the IBDR. Uh, software for the manufacturer uh, needs to be able to claim a specific intended purpose uh, and the software, uh, if the software has a clinical benefit, uh, there's a requirement for clinical evidence to demonstrate that it's in conformity uh, as part of the, the assessment. Uh, software for which the manufacturer does not claim medical intent, uh, such software is intended to drive or influence out of the scope. Of, of the guidance. So this is really about uh, medical devices software. In April 2020, uh, the EU uh, released its uh, regulation 2020-561. Uh, this is important and most of you I'm sure are aware of it, that the uh, proposed application, date of application for the medical device regulations uh, are basically delayed by, by one year. Uh, at the same time, it, it postpones the date of repeal for the existing directive um, for both the uh, MDD as well as the uh, active uh, directive. Um, implementation dates have extended until May 26, 2021. Uh, and this was in an effort to deal with uh, limitations and shortages as it relates to the pandemic. Um, it is important to note, though, that companies are still expected to comply with the MDR requirements if their product is still under a directive uh, from a cert certificate perspective. And that includes post-market surveillance, market surveillance, uh, vigilance, uh, registration of economic operators, uh, as well as registration of the devices. So all that will still apply even if you are uh, under the, uh, the medical device directive certificate. And then kind of graphically, uh, how these uh, changes are kind of being implemented from a timeline perspective. Uh, this was a schematic that uh, was provided by BSI, uh, but you can see um, that the original uh, date of application, which would have been May 2020, uh, that's been moved now to May 2021. Uh, directed certificates would still be void uh, regardless by May 26, 2024. Um, so, 
technically, if your product is is uh, has a current uh, unexpired EC certificate under the directive, uh, you would have until May 2024 for that product uh, to be on the market. Uh, after that date, you would need to comply with the MDR uh, from a from an assessment perspective. And then in June and August, uh, there were a couple of guidances that came out. Uh, this one particular, again, about UDI for systems and procedural packs. Um, the guidance basically provides uh, clarification on how to apply for registration of a system or, or a pack of products uh, and to obtain the SRN number. Um, they have to undergo UDI registration as described in Article 29. Uh, and the UDI would basically cover the same group of components and same intended purpose, uh, regardless of the original components, component manufacturer's uh, UDI. In addition, there was a MDCG uh, position paper that was uh, published for the use of Unimed uh, actor registration module. Um, this basically this this guidance this this position paper. Uh, confirms that the Unimed database, which is what's used for the registration of products in the UDI, uh, will is expected to be fully functional by May of 2022. And that the commission has confirmed that its uh, readiness uh, to be deployed as an active registration module uh, will be ready as, as of December 1st, uh, 2020, which is in just about a week or so. Uh, and then there's the guidance on classification for in vitro diagnostics, uh, specifically this is the one uh, MDCG 2020-16. Uh, uh, again, it provides a clear definition about how uh, manufacturers, notified bodies, health institutions are to classify IVDs prior to being put on the market under the IVDR. Uh, it's also into intend, intended to inform regulators and other stakeholders uh, with regards to assessing the classes that are attributed to in vitro diagnostics by a manufacturer or health institution. Uh, okay. And then related uh, FDA changes, uh, FDA also published a, a new uh, guidance for industry, uh, UDI policy regarding compliance date for class one and unclassified devices. Um, in this particular guidance, uh, FDA makes it known that they're, they do not intend to enforce the, the standard dating or UDI, UDI labeling uh, for uh, class one or unclassified products before uh, September 24, 2022. Uh, but now that doesn't apply to uh, implantable or life supporting or life sustaining devices, uh, even if they're um, considered unclassified. Uh, FDA also published a guidance on the accreditation scheme, uh, their pilot program. Uh, specifically, this is to accredit uh, testing labor laboratories to provide uh, uh, data for, for submissions. Uh, testing laboratories can be accredited uh, to assess the conformance of devices within uh, FDA recognized consensus standards. And the FDA may determine uh, if the accrediting laboratory uh, is acceptable. Uh, they do that uh, certainly during the initial uh, assessment, and then they will conduct periodic audits of those laboratories. Additional recent uh, FDA changes, uh, providing regulatory submissions uh, for medical devices in electronic format. Uh, this guidance document uh, describes and discusses the types of submissions that need to be uh, submitted electronically, uh, the timetable and process for implementing those requirements, and the criteria for waivers and exemptions from the electronic submission format. Um, they provide a nice table within the guidance document uh, which specifies what, uh, what uh, types of submissions can be exempted and uh, which ones have to be supplied by electronic means. Uh, they also published a uh, supporting uh, guidance called eCopy Program for Medical Device Submissions. 
uh, explains the new e-copy program uh, as it relates to uh, submissions to CDRH. Uh, the electronic copy or e-copy is an electronic version of your submission uh, and usually is submitted either a compact disc uh, or a DVD or a flash drive, which was more common. Uh, it is important to note that the e-copy submission must be accompanied by a paper copy of the cover letter uh, that you're providing with the submission. Okay. And then on to FDA's COVID-19 response. Again, there's been a flurry of activity this year. Uh, in March, uh, the Health and Human Services uh, Group authorized the emergency use of medical devices, as many of you are aware. Uh, in order to stem off uh, the availability and shortages uh, of those devices that relates to support of uh, uh, COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, they have provided uh, submission templates to help companies with their EUA requests. Uh, but it's important to note that the, the Health and Human Services uh, declaration, EUA declaration, may be terminated, at which point any of the products that uh, have been uh, allowed to be on the market under uh, an EUA uh, will no longer be in effect, and so therefore would have to be taken off the market. Uh, in addition, FDA has, uh, as several examples here, uh, uh, revoked uh, individual product EUAs that have come up due to uh, the fact that either the criteria for the EUA was no longer met or circumstances uh, for re revocation uh, was appropriate based on um, public health and safety. Uh, so, in the case of uh, uh, ChemBio's antibody assay uh, and other antibody assays that were found to be uh, basically they couldn't confirm that uh, the product was meeting its performance claims. Uh, in addition, they uh, put out a policy on coronavirus disease uh, 2019, a test for public uh, health emergency. So this guidance basically provides uh, the details about laboratories uh, providing uh, LDD tests that uh, support uh, testing for COVID uh, as part of an EUA submission. Uh, laboratories can use their test if it's been validated under CLIA uh, while they prepare their EUA request. Uh, but the FDA expects the lab to submit within 15 days a complete EUA request uh, of being able to provide it on the market and after it's been successfully validated. Uh, if there are modifications to the LDT, a uh, new EUA or an amendment will need to be submitted. Um, and there is a process by which they've defined uh, the ability to validate using bridging studies uh, where you would not complete the EUA amendment. Uh, but that data needs to be submitted to the FDA for review. Uh, there have been a lot of product specific enforcement policy statements uh, that have been issued since uh, the beginning of 2020. Uh, obviously the purpose is to help expand the availability and capabilities uh, of these products to healthcare professionals. Uh, some of these which are included, uh, this isn't an extensive, all, uh, exhaustive list here, but modifications to uh, FDA cleared uh, molecular tests for influenza and RBS, uh, RSV, uh, remote digital pathology devices, uh, imaging systems, uh, non-invasive fetal and monitor, uh, monitoring devices, um, uh, clinical electronic uh, thermometers, gowns, uh, other apparel, and gloves, uh, ventilators, and then sterilizers. Um, but again, there's there's a, there's many more. Um, these policies are intended to make an effect during the public health emergency, uh, and I'm sure they'll be re revoked uh, once uh, the emergency is is concluded uh, by the Department of Human Health and Human Services. There was an additional guidance that uh, FDA has uh, provided uh, to industry in response uh, to the effects of COVID-19 public health emergency on formal meetings and user fee applications. Uh, specifically, this uh, document uh, talks about the fact that FDA intends to continue 
to support the industry by uh, utilizing teleconferencing video conferences instead of in-person meetings for uh, QSUB uh, presentations. Uh, the FDA is experiencing a significant increase in COVID-19 activities, uh, meaning pre-EUAs, EUAs, and, and development of policies. Uh, that clearly has been shifting uh, resources uh, for, from the staff at FDA to focus on uh, the pandemic, which is causing, in certain cases, them to miss their MEDUFA uh, goal dates uh, for completion of reviews. Uh, if, for the policy here, if they were to miss a, a date, a decision communication date, uh, within 10 days uh, after that date for 510K and 20 days after for a PMA, uh, they will provide a written response uh, to the uh, sponsor, uh, providing feedback in regards to major outstanding review topics, uh, reasons for what's preventing the FDA from completing uh, their final decision on the review, and an estimated date for completion. And that was my presentation. Thank you, and I'll be around for after uh, TJ finishes his uh, presentation later on. If you have any questions, you can reach me at the following email address uh, for Pearl Pathways, as well as our online presence. Okay, thanks for that, John. Um, I, again, uh, very informative, uh, gives us a, a, an idea of what's going on with the IVDR, MDR, and, and EUA in, uh, and with the FDA, so that's fantastic. Um, so I wanted to focus on the Asia Pacific piece and uh, as, as part of this conversation. Um, but before we kick off here on my side, um, just wanna give you a little bit of background about Brandwood CKC. Um, ultimately, we are a regulatory quality and commercialization consultancy in Australia. We're based here in Sydney. Um, we have our headquarters in Sydney, but we have international offices in Los Angeles, Wellington, uh, Taipei and Hong Kong. Um, we are uh, regulatory and quality consultants across the medical device, diagnostic, and uh, pharmaceutical space. And this is uh, due to the fact that we've just recently undergone a merger with a pharmaceutical partner. And uh, we find that uh, very helpful for products because there's blurring of the lines into combination and companion diagnostics. Um, what we do, uh, we kind of, uh, I think we consider ourselves a full service consultancy when it comes to regulatory uh, in the medical device diagnostic and pharmaceutical space. So anything from uh, compliance, uh, submissions, post market compliance, uh, appeals, um, we, we have the expertise and capability within house. Um, I won't go into my bio, but uh, and that was adequately described earlier, so we'll get started. So my agenda today is really going to be um, starting off, I'm gonna to try to dovetail with what John has said about COVID-19 and what's going on in Asia PAC. Um, I wanna give you just the highest of high overviews of medical devices and IVDs in the Asia Pacific. I'm gonna talk about the EU's MDR and IVDR, um, the, how that's impacted uh, Asia Pacific, and I'm gonna give you some specific examples. I'm gonna talk about some regulatory changes in Australia. I'm gonna then go on to China and then do Japan. Um, and finally, we'll make some conclusions and some forecasting for what we anticipate in the near future. Um, so Asia Pacific is extremely large and ultimately I could spend days talking about all the individual countries in, in Asia Pacific, but in order to make this uh, presentation, you know feasible and within the uh, actual time constraints, I'm going to focus on a few key geographies within Asia Pacific. Um, ultimately, uh, Asia, uh, Australia, Singapore, Japan, China, and Korea um, will be talked about during this, co this conversation. So let's, as, as I suggested, let's dovetail with what John has just talked about with the FDA and their EUA policy and uh, talk about what that means in, in Australia. So, or excuse me, in Asia Pacific. Um, although it's termed differently, and you know, again, we use the term EUA or emergency use authorization uh, quite a lot. 
Um, it may be termed differently, but there is multiple or there are multiple countries that have created exemptions, expedited pathways, priority pathways for devices and diagnostics in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In general, the process is mainly the same where in, in Asia Pacific, where high risk products are given priority pathway, but they're not given exemptions. So there's still some review that's provided by the regulator to you know, inform or to make a decision or initial decision on the safety and effectiveness of the device. Lower risk may have opportunities for exemption um, for certain groups and certain conditions. So when we talk about low risk devices like uh, PPE, masks, gloves, uh, you know, surgical gowns, there are opportunities. Now, a lot of these exemptions have been exhausted or have been revoked, but some of them still exist. And, and we want to just highlight a few of these coming up. I'll start by just talking about the response in Australia initially. Um, realistically, we can divide it into two stages here, the pre-market process and the post-market processes. Um, in the pre-market processes, uh, what we can say is that class one devices that are non-sterile, non-measuring are auto-included on the ARTG. So these are class one notifications. So there really wasn't much that the TGA needed to do for these types of devices if they were specific to COVID-19. But in those that were specific to COVID-19 that required more review or more um, assessment, uh, the TGA has put a couple of uh, programs in place. So the first one I'll talk about is COVID-19 tests and ventilators. Effectively, they prioritize the review of these. So what would normally take a conformity assessment six to nine months, they've reduced and consolidated that down to six to nine weeks. So that's significant. And again, they're still going to review um, your application because they want to make sure that they can assess and uh, uh, make sure that the safety and effectiveness of the device is there. But you know, with this program, they're waiving the priority application fees. They're, you know, uh, reducing the turnaround time so and, and providing a lot more interactive review. Australia also on the pre-market side has created a few emergency legislation exemptions. So they made exemptions for corona testing, coronavirus testing um, for accredited pathology labs. They had a federal purchase program for uh, use, uh, emergency use devices. They also had a, a, a bespoke domestic ventilator uh, policy so that if manufacturers in Australia were manufacturing, uh, were, were going to manufacture ventilators in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, that they would have a special pathway and a special set of requirements that needs to be met. For the post-market side, um, what was really the, the big thing that happened here is because they were providing these expedited and priority pathway reviews, is that they made a lot of conditions for approval for these devices. So they did the initial assessment. They said that they, they you know, felt like the product was safe and effective from the data presented, but they wanted to make sure that they followed up and that they provided conditions of approval that the manufacturer would have to address as part of the, the long-term uh, uh, use of the device. Um, they also have looked at taking some samples. So in COVID-19 diagnostic tests and for some PPE articles, um, they would actually take devices or take uh, materials and test them because what they didn't want to have happen was people use bringing product over that was substandard. Um, they also had an expedited recall pathway. So if there were COVID-19 products that require that need a recall because they were determined not to be safe and effective, they required that to happen within 24 hours. And then there were special advertising guidelines that were presented as part of the COVID-19 response and the products that were related to COVID-19. Um, one in particular that I wanted to call out was the hand sanitizers or uh, the sanitizers in general. Um, in, if, if we talk high level uh, broad strokes, um, hand sanitizers are always driven by the claims and their instructions for use. So if you're making claims that are specific against uh, specific pathogens, viruses, COVID-19, they require registration. But if you're making general or low level claims, they don't require that level, they don't require the registration activities and, and may actually fall into an exemption. Um, in, 20, uh, in early part of 2020, um, 27th of March actually, they, just, they made a determination that there was an urgent need for high volumes and they actually passed legislation to allow certain formulations of hand sanitizers to be excluded from the registration requirements. So if they were ethanol uh, between, I think, 80 and 75%, uh, had distilled water, glycerol, and hydroperoxide, if they were of that formulation, then you had an exemption pathway. 
Um, they wanted to make sure that they still had a high quality product. So they made other additional requirements such as having pharmacy, uh, pharmacopoeial grade uh, ingredients, um, no other ingredients to be added, um, and that they had all the manufacturing records. But with that, they really created a fast pathway to get large amounts of hand sanitizer into Australia under an exemption. Another one we'll talk about here for Australia specifically is the standards for PPE. Effectively, TGA came forward and said there's a rec there are recommended standards that are required for any personal protective equipment, um, and they provided a guidance around that. Um, effectively, it described how the, these products were regulated, how manufacturers of, that, of PPE needed to meet those regulatory obligations, any information about medical devices and registration of the ARTG on, on the ARTG, and then consumers. They gave some in information for consumers about that. And this was important because remember, as part of the initial response to the pandemic, there were a lot of people trying to register or trying to bring products, that PPE product into the market. And because they are medical devices, TGA wanted to make sure that they were done right. And so they provided these guidances to help manufacturers understand what their obligations were and what registration activities they needed to complete. Um, there have been a, a few other changes that we'll talk about here with the TGA. Um, the, these are related to uh, the, a delay, um, again, with COVID-19, basically a lot of the legislation or a lot of the guidances that they intended on publishing in 2020 have actually been pushed out. And so I just wanted to briefly touch on this. Um, effectively, we pushed out the date for the medical device software um, guidance and personalized medical devices from uh, 2020 to 25th of February of next year. Um, we've also pushed out the date for reclassification of certain devices. These include spinal implants, active uh, implantable medical devices, um, those, that, those medical devices that administer drugs or biologicals, um, those that uh, are active that include a diagnostic function. These have all been reclassified. And for, or because of the COVID-19 response and the prioritization that the TGA had to have, they have shifted that date to the 25th of November next year. Also, 25th of November next year, there is a, uh, a guidance coming out with the systems and procedure packs and the requirements around essential principles for those devices. Um, just to give you a little bit of a, a higher level uh, on two specific types of devices and ones that we see a lot of in the COVID-19 space, um, diagnostics. Um, uh, I'll talk about two countries here and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk in general. but. Ultimately, we've seen a lot more expedited pathways for diagnostics. We've not seen any exemptions um, because they are they need to be assessed and some level of, of rigor put around safety and effectiveness. So Japan has created a expedited, expedited review. And more importantly, they've created approvals with this significant post-market comments or commitment, excuse me. So effectively, they're saying, listen, we'll bring it onto the market, but you need to make sure that you're complying to all the things that we request that would typically be part of the pre-application activities, but they're allowing that as kind of a post-market conditioning. Um, same with the TGA, uh, almost identical. So uh, TGA has prioritized all of its applications. Typically, they would charge you $10,000 for that, but now they're saying we'll do that for free because it's COVID-19 related. And in doing so, they said, we don't expect you to have all the data that you would because we want, you know, want devices out there for in response to this uh, pandemic. But we understand that there's going to be additional data that needs to be collected. So as part of this, they've said, we'll introduce these to the market, but there are post-market conditions that need to be uh, applied to the product. So that's the diagnostic side. If we talk about the ventilator side, um, there are exemptions. Um, again, th this is slightly different because there are uh, a bit more of uh, leniency, especially for domestic manufacturers. So what was really the attempt here in Asia Pacific was that manufacturers that weren't traditionally medical device manufacturers were looked at to say, okay, do you have capacity or the ability to make ventilators in case of you know, uh, extreme need in our hospital systems? And so to, uh, I'll, I'll bring up Australia and Japan again. Um, Australia basically created a less burdensome pathway. And when they, when they did this, they took some uh, inputs from the MHRA in the UK and said, here are the mini minimal technical specifications that we expect for a ventilator to be approved under this exemption pathway. 
And if you can comply to these, then we will give you uh, approval and we can start using them in Australia immediately. However, there will be significant conditions for approval. Japan, um, again, they have created a guidance specifically for those non-medical device manufacturers. So auto manufacturers, uh, air, uh, aircraft uh, manufacturers, uh, technology firms, if they had the ability to make ventilators, they created a guidance specifically for it. It's actually quite elegant and it was very much at a, uh, it's, it's less regulatory speak, it's much more practical in the guidance that they created. Now, with the ventilators and diagnostics, the one, you know, there's obviously one country that's missing from this conversation, and that's China. And the reason that China hasn't been added to this is because China effectively has revoked most of their exemptions or any of their expedited pathways with the NMPA for the COVID-19 response. In fact, they've actually made it hard for manufacturers in China to actually export their products for other countries by requiring anything that's up for export, especially diagnostic tests, to have registration with the NMPA before they can be exported. So uh, there, there, there's a bit of a, a difference here, but what I would say is that Australia and Japan is typical for Asia PAC. These approaches, these, these types of uh, mechanisms for bringing products to the market in a less burdensome manner are consistent with other Asia Pacific countries, China being the one exception. So that kind of covers the COVID-19 stuff. Um, I'm just gonna talk really high level about medical device and IVDs in Asia PAC. Um, effectively, it's a huge area. And so with that, it's very diverse. So, you know, there's a huge difference in how regulators approach medical devices, whether they regulate at all, or whether they rely on uh, other approvals from other tier one um, jurisdictions. Um, some countries perform their own conformity assessment. I'm talking about Korea, Japan, China, um, Australia, um, but others will just rely on those approvals from other tier one uh, regulatory uh, agencies. Um, Labeling requirements are extremely diverse. So again, there may be local language requirements, there may be specific uh, products or specific warnings, contraindications, things like that, that need to be added to the labeling depending on which country you're talking about. But it's, it, it, I just wanna call it out at a high level that you need to think about that before you say, well, we've got a cover for Asia PAC. And again, we use the Australia, China, and Japan as focus countries because they are indicative of what we see happening either eventually in other countries in Asia Pacific or as a, a guidance for other countries as they set up their own regulatory pathways. Basically, for IBDs, you're seeing the same thing. So you're, you're seeing a lot very similar to what's going on with medical devices. The one exception here is that Ultimately, there are some countries that exclude specific uh, uh, diagnostics. They, they do not allow them. They are forbidden for sale in those countries. Countries like Thailand, Vietnam have specific conditions around diagnostics that will not be allowed into the country. Um, again, Australia, China, Japan seem to set, set the stage for all of the other countries. Sometimes they are exactly what other countries will adopt. Sometimes it's, a bad, it's about them actually taking the recognition of the approvals in these countries to accept them into theirs. And sometimes it's a, a conscious decision to reduce the burden and go slightly less uh, scrutiny than these countries. But that's, you know, uh, again, 50,000 foot view of Asia Pacific medical device and IVDs. So with that, I really wanted to, and, and probably the biggest portion or the, the biggest focus of this presentation is really around, okay, IVDR, MDR coming out, EU's got it. How is that gonna affect Asia Pacific? Well, I think ultimately there are numerous countries that accept or use CE marking to fast track. And so, They'll continue to do that until your current certificate expires. So when your MDD certificate expires, as John pointed out, you'll still be able to use that expedited pathway. There are countries that don't use any CE marking or don't allow the CE marking to gather any additional you know, expedi uh, expedited pathways. And you know, obviously those aren't gonna be affected much by CE marking. So Japan, Korea, they have their own conformity assessment pathways. There's no requirements there. Again, of those countries that are big enough to have their own regulatory system or, or have conformity assessment pathways, there are three of note 
that should be talked about when we say, you know, the change to the IVDR, MDR, and that's China. And I'm only going to talk just briefly on Chinese here because ultimately, if your your product is uh, manufactured in the EU, the country of origin requirements are important, and that's where your certificate has to remain valid. Australia has the expedited pathway that we've discussed or, or we've talked about earlier, and so with the CE marking, there's you know a potential uh, change to how products get CE marked or how certificates are. Uh, given, that's going to affect that expedited pathway. Singapore is very much the same, but Singapore took a little bit more pragmatic approach, and I'll get into that here in a second. So again, Australia has, has this expedited pathway available for uh, registration on the ARTG if you have a CE mark for your product and 1345. Um, now, what the TGA has said is that because of what's going on, they are not going to automatically cancel registration or entries into the ARTG. So just because the IBDR or the MDR is coming to effect and the certificates might start to expire and no, no longer be valid, they're not going to automatically cancel. But they do want to work with the sponsor of those devices through the pathway to understand that they've mitigated or have addressed the have a plan for addressing that problem or that, that issue. Um, again, they're going to take steps. They're going to they're going to ensure that the manufacturer has taken steps. They're going to make sure that there's timeliness to the sponsor's uh, actions. They're going to um, make sure that the sponsor is keeping the TGA informed. And then, in, if they're not able to, then there there's an understanding as to whether or not they can find other uh, overseas regulator information that could be provided in lieu of. And then, um, you know what rationale they have as to whether there's a presence or absence of, of for other reasons. So effectively, and just to summarize, TGA is being pragmatic. They're suggesting, listen, we're not going to go and, and go super risk conservative and say, you don't have a certificate. That's how you brought this product into the country. So we're now going to cancel you. They want to work with sponsors and make sure they're doing the right thing. But the key here is that they want to be informed, they want to have a plan, and they want to be kept informed, uh, kept informed of how you're progressing towards that plan. Singapore, as I said before, has a little bit more, uh, has some pragmatism as well. Um, effectively, Singapore has acknowledged that manufacturers may have to make a bunch of changes because of the MDR or IBDR implementation. And you know, especially around labeling and IFUs, things like that. So they actually came out with a guidance just recently that said, for specific types of changes, we're going to actually help you out. We're going to tell you what you need to do and when a submission is needed or not needed. So if you're changing the certificate itself, so you're changing from an MDD to an MDR certificate, a CE certificate, it doesn't require a notification. If you're changing the labeling um, to update for the new uh, safety and performance requirements from the IVDR or MDR, then again, submission is not required. In the time it, it, for those that do require a submission, those would be changes to the labels or IFU that you're talking about. Your material is quote unquote free of something, um, which is one of the requirements here. It's a change notification and it's called a type 5E, which is a pretty simple one. Again, if you're changing the IFU itself for clarification of existing content or addition of safety information as related to the IVDR or the MDR, again, a change notification type 5E. Finally, if you have an IVD, uh, a change to the IFU for IVDs to clarify performance data, and again, that may have been driven by the IVDR implementation, simple change notification type 5E. Um, in, let me just, I'm sorry. Uh, in general, uh, I do want to call it out because we've, we've focused on some the major geographies here, but in general, there's a lot of other smaller countries in Asia Pacific that don't have the infrastructure or resources to do product reviews. And so as such, those guys need foreign evidence for to meet their registration requirements. In most of these, and, and, and what I'm trying to get around here is, in most of these, any tier one regulatory approval will suffice. So just because your CE certificate might be expiring or might need to be revised due to the MDR or IBDR implementation, if you have an additional regulatory approval, say in Canada, Singapore, Australia, Brazil, these could be used in support of 
the application and maintaining that product on the market. Again, I want to focus that they're not necessarily suggesting that you have to, you know, revise anything that's on the market. These are just really on the new products itself. And remember, China, Korea, Japan have their own conformity assessment application processes. And so they will go through a formal review. Okay. Um, so we've, we've talked about COVID-19. We've talked about a general overview of IVDR, MDR here in Asia Pacific. We've talked about what, what changes are happening um, because of the IVDR, MDR implementation. But I wanted to give you guys an idea as to what the overall regulatory changes might look like in three key geographies. And those would be Australia, Japan, and China. Um, I'm going to start with Australia. Um, obviously, this is where we're based, near to our heart. Um, but the first thing I'll say is that there, there are some recent changes. And, and it's really important that you keep abreast of these because even, even though some of the guidances have been pushed off into 2021, these, guide, these, these additional pieces of information or additional guidances, uh, we'll call it uh, letters of advice or uh, you know, inputs from the regulator, have been coming out and they're still, com they're still coming out. Um, so the first one we want to talk about is the update to postmark clinical follow-up studies. So 20, uh, 20th of October of this year, TGA worked with the GHTF members so to come to a, an agreement as to what the expectation is for clinical follow-up studies. So that is currently out on the uh, TGA's website. Um, another one here is that it is exactly what we talked about uh, earlier um, in that they're, how are they dealing with delays? Uh, actually, John talked about it earlier, let me clarify. How are they, how is TGA dealing with delays in medical device conformity assessment applications due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the MDR implementation? And again, the reference that we talked about earlier is part of this as well. Um, there is some guidance around Brexit. Um, and the implications for those goods in Australia. Um, so they have provided advice around what's their expectation and what they expect from manufacturers for those coming out of the UK or as they relate to Brexit activities. And then last one, um, they've provided some clinical evidence guidelines specific to implantable devices in an MRI environment. And this one's actually quite useful because we see a uh, a lot more information, uh, uh, we, we see a lot better pathway as to their expectations when it comes to implantable devices that may or may not be MRI safe, compatible, so on and so forth. So there's some good information and evidence that they provide as part of this guidance. Um, two other ones that I'll call out here, and these ones are, are, are pretty significant. Um, the first one is surgical mesh. Um, TJ has had a lot of issues with um, a lot of post-market surveillance issues with sur surgical meshes. In fact, that's not unique to TGA, it's pretty worldwide. So they're actually doing some up classification of these devices. In this guidance document, they also talk about how they're going to work with manufacturers to discuss the options. So how are they gonna move forward if your device is gonna be up classified? Obviously, they're not gonna require recall, but how are they going to either ensure that you can sustain product on the market and work with you as part of an interactive process? The, the last one here, um, regulation of software as a medical device, this one's really substantive. So uh, effectively, TGA has created several guidances around software as a medical device, but as part of the GHDF and the IMDRF uh, working groups, they've contributed a lot of their advice to technical documents that revolve around the software as medical device. But as part of that, they want to make sure that they translate it into uh, guidances for TGA specific activities. And there's two areas that they're, they're really focusing on now. The first one is that they intend on having devices that will be quote unquote carved out from existing ARTG listing requirements. And these are going to be those devices that are typically consumer health products. Uh, they might be related to um, dissemination of other health information, but they're trying to carve these out to be pragmatic as to, you know, who's going to need to go into the, to the market and who needs an ARTG registration. The other thing that they're focusing on is that they understand that software as a medical device is typically 
not made by medical device manufacturers. It may come from various sources, may come from uh, technology companies that aren't familiar with the software as a medical device as it relates to medical device regulations. So they are intending on creating a technical document or a guidance document to suggest what in a more naive or I guess uh, lay language as to those businesses and how they might be, uh, how they need to position themselves so that they can get ARTG entry. Again, these guys might be completely new to the medical device industry, so they're providing this as a proactive uh, step for them to understand the, the regulations better. Um, other consultations, uh, so the you know TGA has a, a, a very good habit of reaching out to industry and uh, consultancies and things like that to get some information about their proposed changes to guidances and legislation. Um, right now, there are no open uh, cons consultations. There are a few that have just recently closed. Um, UDI, uh, adverse event reporting, um, again, software-based products, SM ASAMD, which is actually gonna yield, yield a guidance change, um, EU changes, and self-tests and IVDs. These have all been recently closed. And again, shows TGA's commitment to getting that feedback from the industry and making sure that they can make guidances and regulations that are consistent with the legislation, but also usable by industry itself. Okay, so that's Australia. Move into China. Um, first thing I'll say is that NMPA has just recently issued 34 industry standards. And that's that's significant because again, this, this on an annual basis, there's always new standards that are issued by the NMPA. And if your device falls into one of these, you need to be aware of it because the, the expectation is that you're able to meet or comply to that, that standard. Um, so most of these uh, 34 um, were related to specific types of devices, um, indicators for orthopedic, cardiovascular, uh, radiology, clinical, clinical chemistry, and hematology. They're all specific, are industry specific standards, but there are five general standards that I just wanna point out here. Um, the first one is the medical device software lifecycle process. And that's significant. Again, it's you can kind of get the, the feeling that everybody's talking about software as a medical device. And that is true. And every regulator has having is having to address this uh, eventually or appropriately to make sure that they're getting the right type of information in their regulatory applications. Next one is preclinical animal research. Then we had some, uh, a, a new standard around bio load control levels, uh, another standard around energy consumption measurements um, for uh, medical equipment. And then the last one is uh, guidance on medical device soft packaging and how you want to do the design and evaluation. So again, these are general standards. They apply to anybody in the medical device space that is looking to list with the NMPA or do an application through the NMPA. There are more product-specific standards that should be you should be aware of as well. Um, NMPA is spending a lot of time on the SM and SAMD, and like I said, that that was one of the most significant uh, general standards that was updated as part of the uh, the 34 that were uh, created this year. Um, but I, I want to call a few things. So it was released in October. Um, they had some technical uh, guidelines for software as a medical device provided out in the 5th of June, and that had specific information about the dossier and what needed to be there for registration and registration renewal processes. Um, in the 4th of June, so just before that, they actually provided a guidance on on-site inspection. And although that sounds like it's specific to on-site audits, it is but it actually provides manufacturers a bit more information as to the expectation of their quality management system. So having, you know, what's in your, your GMP handbook, you know, what your site capability requirements might be, the documentation filing requirements, and what design and development needs to be under the controls, and then also your post-market surveillance requirements. So although it's termed as an on-site inspection, if I'm building a software as a medical device product, I wanna take a look at that because there are some expectations for the quality management system piece that'll be contained within it. Um, there also were a couple of updates that were specific to submissions that are going to NMPA. Um, both of these are really about the, the NMPA's movement to a more electronic system. Um, the first one was basically allowing electronic submissions, uh, basically materials to be submitted electronically and signatures to be provided electronically. 
Remember, before it was all paper based. You actually had to physically deliver these things to NMPA in Beijing. Um, but now there's, they're, they're moving forward with some trials on the electronic implementation. Um, we do want to note though, paper based is still acceptable. Uh, then the last one is, or the second one here, is that they are working on creating the uh, registration certificates electronically as well. So not only can you submit, but you will actually pro get pro provided your registration certificate electronically, and that is being trialed currently. And it's anticipated that it's after its trial, if it goes successfully, that, that will be added to a new uh, requirement standard. So we've done Australia, we've done China. Now let's just have a quick chat about Japan. Um, I guess the big thing I'd say about Japan is that really there hasn't been a lot of movement. Um, I, the big thing here is that COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been a huge focus for PMDA. And so as such, even though they're traditionally very good about providing updates and new guidances, we haven't seen much, no, nothing major in the last six months. Um, I will make a note that there are current guidances and commentaries that are out for review and, and, and potential publishing. And the two that, are, that stand out in my mind are the software as a medical device, again, consistent theme amongst all the regulators. And then they're also doing a little bit more of a deep dive into 3D printing and custom devices. So I'm anticipating that once they have uh, kind of gotten a little bit more control on their regulatory processes with the COVID-19 pandemic, we will see these uh, guidances published by PMDA uh, shortly thereafter. Um, I do want to call out that MDSAP um, has been uh, more and more uh, use of it in Japan. Uh, remember, MDSAP is the Med Medical Device Single Audit Program. Um, it is an add-on or an additional kind of set of documentation and uh, requirements for you as a med medical book device manufacturer or IVD manufacturer in the quality management system. And as long as Japan's in scope of your MD MDSAP certificate, we are seeing a lot more companies get extreme uh, efficiency in their review process because they're no longer requiring an on-site audit. And given the current situation and, and not a lot of on-site audits are gonna be done anyway, there's a, even more of a push by the PMDA for people to come in with the MDSAP uh, compliance and within Japan, or with Japan in scope. Um, because uh, there hasn't been a lot of guidances put out, um, you know, there has been a lot of focus on, well, I should say the, the cause and effect here is that because of COVID-19, they haven't put a lot of guidances out, but they have focused on what role they're going to play. And this, uh, the first sentence here is taken directly from their website. Basically, they have acknowledged that they play a key role in facilitating device development of medical products. And if they're in urgent need, they need to focus on it. So what they've done so far is that we've seen accelerated uh, acceleration on clinical development. So they're providing inputs to manufacturers as to the clinical requirements for COVID-19 products or candidate products. Um, they're providing management uh, or guidance for the management of the conduct of those trials. So whereas they used to basically leave manufacturers to it, they're actually providing a lot more guidance and acceleration of these clinical development activities to help bring COVID-19 products onto market. And the other thing is in the clinical device, or excuse me, clinical trial space, they're actually working to create a more efficient way of getting IRB approvals. And they're doing that electronically through, you know, uh, virtual meetings or emails instead of requiring on-site conversations and documentations to be shared. So I think they're doing the right thing and they're definitely focused on COVID-19 and facilitating bringing COVID-19 products to market. So that, that kind of covers a lot of the, the, the information that I wanted to present, but I think it's important to look a little bit into the future. So realistically, the major changes that are happening in, in global medical device and IVDs uh, and their impact to Asia Pacific, um, the two things that we talked about, and John actually started this presentation off by suggesting the changes that are in the MDR and the IVDR. And then we also talked about the emergency use authorizations that are being issued by the uh, FDA. Effectively, how does that impact Asia Pacific? Well, We've seen some of it, but it's still a little early to tell. Um, again, we see a lot of the larger regulators getting on, on top of it in front of this. 
putting out guidances, putting out uh, requirements for when change notifications are there, but we haven't seen it all. And I do think we will have more guidances, more information coming from regulators in Asia Pacific about the MDR and IVDR changes. Um, we're seeing more alternative approaches. So instead of just the, the standard, hey, listen, this is the way we want all of our documentation, we need it all up front, and then we'll give you an approval, and then you can mark it. Because of COVID-19, you're seeing more exemptions, you're seeing more alternative or expedited, prioritized pathways, and a lot more of this, give us enough information for us to make a general dis uh, decision that is safe and effective, and then we'll allow you to put it on the market, and then you're under the condition that you provide us more information later. And we're seeing a lot more of that. Um, we're getting a lot more cooperation. So although it's really hard to schedule meetings, uh, we are seeing a lot more cooperation by the regulators in Asia Pacific because of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, um, specific to COVID-19 products, but also we're seeing more adaptive and more pragmatic um, guidance is coming out on general devices because the TGA, uh, PMDA, uh, NMPA, all of these letters um, are realizing that they could be very much overwhelmed by MDR, IVDR changes. And so they're being a little bit more pragmatic about it. And because of the COVID-19 thing, we are seeing some delays in guidances and, and, and some harmonization activities. Um, so, that's kind of what I had. Um, I do want to let you guys know that uh, Brand with CKC does a lot of deep dives and a lot of specific webinars on these types of pieces of information. Um, so if you have a chance and, and would like information on any one of these topics or any, any topic in general, um, please go check out our website. Um, we have webinars, usually about 30 to 40 minutes long, provide a very deep dive into specific topics. So have a, have a think about that. But in the meantime, if you have questions after this presentation, I know we're going to have a Q&A time here just now. But if you have questions or need any advice, please feel to reach out to me or the help at brandwithckc.com uh, address. Thanks all. OK. Um, not sure who's, uh, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll take this forward. Um, now that we've come to the end of our presentations, I'll give it back to Carolyn to uh, walk, through, walk us through some of the questions that have come through. So Carolyn, if you wanna take it over. Thanks, TJ. So we've got a couple questions in here. Um, let's see. The first question is, let's see, as to, the, as to software in one of your first slides, into mm -hmm. which category does AI software fall? So I, I, I provided this little teacher was talking, I did provide an answer uh, to Lewis. Uh, but uh, if the AI falls under the definition of a medical device software, I mean, i.e. I, software that's intended to be used uh, for the purpose of what a medical device is, uh, then clinical evidence would be required as part of the uh, MDR. Uh, to be able to justify its conformity, uh, its assessment pathway. Um, so uh, if it is uh, software that, you know, uh, if, it's, if it's an AI that isn't, isn't functioning uh, specifically in terms of a medical device, uh, potentially it, it might not be, it might not fall under the guidance uh, or, or require clinical evidence, but um, that's really where it comes to play. Is that, it, 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 if it's uh, if it's providing clinical uh, benefit, and I'll just I'll just add a, a, a bit of a context for Asia Pacific. Um, you know, ultimately, what what you said, John, is absolutely the same in Asia Pacific. You know, it's really about what is the what is the AI being used for? Is it is it part of the software that's making a clinical decision or making a diagnostic result? Um, in which case it's going to be included and you need to have some presentation within the clinical evaluation report or the performance evaluation report. Um, AI that is outside of this, and again, we're seeing, you know, there's a ton of activity in the software as a medical device. And, and I think the next logical step for these regulators is to tackle the machine learning AI piece. Um, we know that some of 
tried to dip their toes slightly into the water so far. But I do anticipate that there's going to be requirements to provide more information on this because everybody's, I shouldn't say everybody, there's a lot of companies doing this and it's not clear as to, you know, when you have AI, when's enough? You know, when do you, when can you say, hey, I've got enough information to have a viable product onto the market and I will continue to improve it. Those are all things that the regulators need to consider. But as John suggested, if it's part of what makes up the clinical decision or a diagnostic result, you need to make sure that it's included within your CER, your performance evaluation report. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, our next question, with regard to the ASCA pilot program, how does this align with OSHA NRTL labs or ISO 17025 accredited labs? So un under the pilot, uh, the ASCA recognized accreditation bodies, uh, which are accrediting testing laboratories, would be accrediting them uh, based on the specifications from ISO 17025. So it, it is directly related to, uh, to, the, to the pilot program. All right, our next question. Can you speculate whether MDR might may be extended another year given COVID, the lack of notified bodies and the requirement to have an in-person audit to transition to MDR? Uh, yeah, I, my guess is, is that that is gonna cause problems and it will probably uh, cause a delay in the DOA. Um, you know, even as of today, there's only 17 notified bodies that are designated for MDR and only four for IVDR. Um, mm -hmm. So I really do think that, you know, the fact that uh, most companies that, that I've spoken with this year, you know, they're not letting people come on site uh, to do any kind of work unless you, you're obviously an employee of the company. And even then, uh, they're, they're doing it in, in unique ways. So uh, I don't see how uh, we're going to get around that until we can get past uh, really the vaccination piece. So uh, I do expect there to be delay. Yeah, and, and and I think it's interesting you say that, John. I think that's extremely valid. And I think that the interesting part, though, is when we we've had some conversations with some of the competent authorities in Europe, and they're pretty insistent that this was a one-time thing and that they don't anticipate another year of delay. So it's going to be a very interesting challenge for them because I, yeah, all these things are right. You know, we've got COVID, people aren't going on site, people aren't traveling anywhere, we don't have a vaccine, you know, we, we have 17 notified bodies and... That's not nearly you know, enough, so... Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a ton of them and then you think about Brexit, adding more complications to this and BSI being one of the largest reviewers previously, now they have to move all their stuff to the Netherlands. There's just too many questions to... to consciously believe that it's going to be acceptable to, to just have this one-year hiatus. That being said, the, the, the message that's coming from these company authorities is, yeah, that's what, what we're going to do. And so I just have no idea how it's going to work in practice. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, let's see. This question appears similar to the last one, but... Um, uh, how many how many notified bodies are accredited to date? Uh, this I just mentioned, there's 17 uh, designated right now for MDR, and there's four for IBDR. I, and, and I should add to the, the, the previous conversation about the delay of the MDR. Um, the IBDR, <laughs> I think we're, we're, we're forgetting about the big elephant in the room on the IBDR front is that with the classification differences in the new conformity assessment pathways uh, or the rules in the IBDR, we have a, 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 the same issue about to happen with that. Um, although we've got a couple more years, well, not that many, um, we've gone from a situation where 20% of all diagnostics are regulated and notified body reviewed. Now 90, 90% of these devices or these diagnostics need to go through notified body review in some effort. And there's only four of them. And, you know, we talk about the, the, the issues that are happening with the MDR and that's like the, the, the competent authorities again are saying we're, we intend on having the IVDR implemented on that day. So I, I'm, I'm extremely worried that this is, you know, it's going to be a bit of a nightmare for 
uh, Europe as it relates to diagnostics spe uh, specifically. Okay, let's see, we have another, another question here. Um, it seems that the handling of auditing SAMD production for a cloud-based product is short on specifics. Will the new guidances address the differences with auditing a software manufacturer that does not actually have manufacturing facilities? Um, well, I'll, I'll start on this one, and John, you can add some more context to it. Um, remember that, you know, yeah, software is interesting because, you know, who actually manufactures it and what's actually to be manufactured. Um, I think that the big thing here is that the, fir the first part of the question is, I don't think guidances that are going to be created in the near future are going to be that specific. I don't think they're going to go into it. I think they may touch on the requirements and what is expected as part of the regulatory application and the, the processes around that. But I don't think they're going to go into level of detail on you know, auditing um, and, and the specifics there. The other thing I'll say here, though, is that remember, it's all about documentation. And you know where where SMD products really live and breathe and die is on that IEC 62304 standard. So having your documentation created to that standard, that's where the majority of these audits audits are going to be. And I think you know the paradigm of on-site audits is going to change. I mean we're in a situation where you know nobody's really able to go on site you know due to COVID-19. Um, so there's going to be more and more virtual audits performed by all of the regulators. So I think there's a combination of a lot of those things that'll go into the, the, the approach moving forward. Um, like I said, I don't anticipate guidances that are coming out in the near term to have that level of specificity. I think you need to make sure that you're supporting your documentation as it relates to IEC 62304 as much as possible because that's going to be the majority of what's being audited. and. I get. I, I would imagine that on-site audits are going to be less and less, uh, you know, from this point forward. And you know, software may be one of those lucky candidates that, because there's not traditional manufacturing being done, maybe one of them that gets shoehorned into a virtual audit most of the time. John, anything to add on that? Yeah, I was going to say I, I'm not aware of uh, any specific guidance system in development for uh, for auditing of uh, software as medical device. Um, you know, specifically the production piece. Uh, I mean, I think they would continue to shoehorn it under existing uh, notified body uh, guidance that that would exist to to audit in general. Uh, so, but I agree. I mean, I think you're right. The, uh, the the main focus of those products is really around the design um, versus the production activities. Yeah. Okay, I am seeing no more questions. Um, so I think right now um, the RAPS Indiana chapter is looking to, um, to give away a free ebook for those of you who have participated, who have attended the presentation. And we have, there's a trivia question in order to earn, possibly earn the book. So the first person to put an answer into the chat will receive the free ebook. And the trivia question is, what does EUA stand for? Carolyn, I think everybody's putting it into the questions instead of the chat. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. No, uh, it, it's um, Caroline. I will reach out. Uh, this is RAPS headquarters. I'll reach you out to you after the conclusion of the oh, webinar well. to give you your information on uh, your free ebook, courtesy of the RAPS Indiana chapter. Again, Caroline, I'll reach out to you after the conclusion of the program. Thank you, TJ and John, for this presentation. Thank you, Carolyn and the RAPS. Uh, Indiana chapter for putting this program together. The completion code is on the screen. Again, you'll receive a follow-up email in 48 hours with the code. If you have any other questions, please contact RAPS Customer Service at 
770-2920, extension 200, or via email at support at raps.org. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation and we'd appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe, stay positive, and have a great, a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you.